everybody. Let me know everybody just logging on and welcome to our weekly webinar. Great having you all on board and uh, lovely to see all the people logging on today. We've got a great discussion ahead of us. I'll give you the official welcome now as we just wait for a few of our people to join us. So yes, good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to our weekly webinar. So as the noonday gun sounds in our Cape Town studio, we thrill to kick off another insightful session. I'm Neil Peterson. I'm the founder and content in chief of Real Estate Investor, South Africa's premier independent real estate content and education platform since 2007. So at REI, we're deeply passionate about serving the South African uh, real estate investor and business community through our digital platform, rei.co.za, our monthly digital magazine, Real Estate Investor, and our virtual and in-person events. And today, I have the pleasure of serving as your host and moderator for our masterclass, and we're thrilled to have you join us for this insightful session. And our topic for today's masterclass is Disrupting Real Estate property technology, and what it gets wrong. So we're going to build upon the insight shared in our latest edition of Real Estate Investor magazine, uh, where we spotlighted Ben Shaw's compelling book, The First Kudu, shedding light on its pivotal insights and implications for the industry. So before I introduce our esteemed guest today, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you happen to accidentally log out during the webinar, don't worry, you simply use the same link as before to get in and for those registered attendees who couldn't join us live for today fret not we'll email you a link to the recording of the webinar alternatively you can access the master class recording under replays in the events section on the rei.co.za website to our audience your participation is highly encouraged please 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 feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar for us to pose to our resident experts today and to pose a question you simply type it and you submit it by the q a box not the chat box that's for general comments located on the bottom right hand side of your screen anytime during the webinar we'll address all your questions in the q a panel uh, discussion that will be in the final session so let's delve into the essence of today's masterclass, and we're honored to introduce our esteemed guests so our first guest is Ben Shaw. He's a seasoned executive and investment professional who has raised startup capital and led diverse teams across South Africa. His expertise spans investment banking, payment technology, property, and private equity, making significant contributions to ventures. And he's also the co-author of the book, The First Kudu, Building a Tech Startup in South Africa, which tells the story of How's Me? a rental technology company founded in South Africa in 2025 that grew to 34 employees and 50,000 registered users. Welcome, Ben. Would you like to briefly introduce yourself to our audience today? No, thanks, Neil. I think that was a great introduction. I'll, uh, I'll wait. Thanks. Wonderful. Great. Great having you on board today. Our second guest, Peter Clark, is the founder and managing partner of RE Dimension Capital, established in South Africa in 2021 to accelerate innovation in the built environment. And RE Dimension Capital has adopted an advisory-based approach to investing and works closely with strategic corporate partners to advise, invest, and innovate future technologies. Peter's background in real estate, starting as property analyst at Investec to head of real estate at 91, positions him as a valuable voice in our discussion today. Welcome to you, Peter. And over to you for a brief intro. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Neil. Again, you captured that well. So we'll uh, happy to intro the business a bit more as we as we get into it. Wonderful. Great stuff. So let's get started with our masterclass. So first of all, Ben, maybe just give us some background about yourself and what you're known for in property because specifically of housing. Sure. Uh, so thanks very much uh, again. And it's, it's great to be here and uh, to connect with Peter as well. Um, my background was investment banking. I left that to found HouseMe. It was uh, 2015, not 2025, although uh, maybe that will uh, history will repeat itself. Um, and uh, and over the course of uh, several years, built up what many people might recall was the uh, first um, residential rental technology platform. 
Uh, I call it platform very deliberately. Uh, we encompassed uh, services and technologies right across the value chain. So unlike a number of uh, tech startups, many of whom have still survived, so I'm, I'm here to learn from them as well, um, we, we really wanted to go as broad and as large as possible. We disintermediated agencies out of the, the rental chain. So we served directly landlords and tenants. And then we built a number of financial services on top of that product uh, that we would then uh, we would then offer. So that that's kind of my entry into the property market. The company itself we can get uh, we can get into a bit later. But uh, the broad strokes are that uh, we we built as a startup. Uh, we competed with agencies. We served um, as you said about, there were about fifty thousand users on our system, uh, and we uh, we sort of had had a uh, a run in with COVID uh, towards the end of of our journey. Okay, great, great intro. I'm looking forward to delving a little bit more into that, Ben. Uh, Peter, just maybe you give us a uh, more in-depth intro and background about yourself and what you do. Cool, thanks, Neil. So, so I suppose my my career has been mainly in the investment management space, really investing primarily in listed property companies, also in some direct property prior prior to to my kind of current life. And and I suppose the gap that that I saw together with my business partner, Matt Marshall, was that the, the big real estate corporates weren't engaging with technology in any meaningful way as an enabler within their business. So real estate guys, whether it be on the residential side or the commercial side, they really thought of themselves as bricks, mortar, what is my tenant, you know, what is my yield, what is my lease, and, and that was kind of it. But failed to really engage with how can they create a better user experience? How can they optimize processes, digitize processes, make them more efficient? Um, uh, how they could use data to make more informed decision making um, and, and a range of a range of other benefits. So went around setting up effectively what is a prop tech investment or venture fund to invest in these early stage tech businesses. But very importantly, it's backed by a whole lot of incumbents in the real estate industry. So what we kind of sold to the big guys and, and our investors are the likes of Gross Point, Burstone, which is an old investing property fund, Liberty Two Degrees, RMB, and, and uh, a number of others, is that they need to invest in tech and innovation for, for their business. So they provide us capital, of which we're targeting strong financial returns. But more importantly for them, they get the operating efficiencies from using that tech within their business, and they get to effectively have a seat at the table to understand what is coming, how they can do things better, more efficiently, and what might disrupt their, their business. And then the early stage tech businesses like what Ben was kind of had established, they need capital to grow, which I'm sure he, he's going to get onto. But more than capital, particularly in the commercial world, they need product or they need distribution. So they need a way to be able to get these enterprise-grade clients onto their platforms um, to, to be able to grow significantly. And so our structure really provides for, for all of that, providing the early stage tech companies capital, but then also introducing them to our partners to, to help them grow and, and scale. And then really sitting in the middle, we, we kind of make sure that there's the right product market fit and these businesses are evolving in the right direction to solve what are the real kind of pain points and challenges from from the commercial guys? And it's not nice to have tech, but it's it's really driving operational efficiency. Awesome, that's a great way to set the scene, and uh, and really look forward to delving into that a little bit more. So Ben, maybe let's start off with you, just in terms of the book. What was the reason behind putting the book together? Yeah, sure. So uh, there are very very few prop tech entrepreneurs in Africa. Uh, far fewer. Uh, that have uh, survived to learn a few lessons and then uh, a subset of them that will put uh, their lessons forward for other entrepreneurs to learn from. So the genesis of uh, the book was actually uh, writing up the case study of House Me. Um, I'm an Alan Gray Orbis Foundation Fellow and uh, the Alan Gray Fellowship uh, has a mission which is to create entrepreneurship across, uh, create and enhance and enable entrepreneurs across the continent. And uh, as such felt that um, my COO and I both having uh, been part of the fellowship, it was incumbent on us to actually share some of what we had learned uh, in in going on this journey. And so we built this this case study, a set of lessons, uh, learnings, things we got right, things we got wrong. And as we were writing it, uh, positioning this, as I say, as a, a business case study, we started remembering some of the more interesting stories, some of the anecdotes, some of the lessons that maybe wouldn't have made it to a business case study. And we recorded it down into what became quite an interesting story. Uh, I say that because other people said that, um, not because I think it's interesting. 
Uh, and that then evolved uh, into a, a manuscript and a publisher suggested that that we actually put it out. Now, the first Kuru uh, speaks to the story of Hausmi. The first half is then the um, sort of the journey we went on uh, from a, a team of one to a team of 40, uh, from, uh, you know, a, a ground zero uh, all the way up to to sort of what, what we achieved. And we went through several funding rounds. We, we explained that. We hired across the country. We uh, had clients as large as um, as large as some listed ones, uh, and then also we we made a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors, and we we detail that uh, and we're quite honest about what we got right, what we got wrong. And in the second half of that book, we break down what we think uh, an entrepreneur, and particularly in property, that was our context, what a property entrepreneur should take as the lessons uh, and the learnings from from our story. And we've got five uh, sort of chapters on that. Uh, one of them uh, is is focus what you should focus on and i know we're going to speak a bit about that today but what are the opportunities on the landscape too was product how do you build tech uh, what are the good what are the bad what to avoid uh, third is team fourth was fundraising and then fifth was the customer experience and so we really uh, tried to give a bit of uh, assistance and a bit of feedback in in our journey as as we went wonderful well, we look forward to delving a little bit more into that and I just want to go over to Peter now, just listening to that, uh, what Ben said. Uh, Peter, I mean, what are you seeing as startup challenges and triumphs uh, that you see as a funder? You're a funder of prop tech businesses. You see yeah. the funding rounds, uh, the highs and lows and growth of businesses and employees and also where they're not making it. So, I, I mean, it's great that, that Ben has published this book and we've recommended it to a lot of startups that we either invested in or looking, looking to invest in. And it's very few people will go and give a very honest account of, of what actually happened and, and kind of the pitfalls and the rights and the wrongs and the lessons and, and everything else. So I think it's a, it's a great thing that, that he's done and we, we've kind of very grateful for it. And as Ben mentioned, this prop tech kind of world in South Africa is at its infancy. Um, in the U.S., it's, it's grown a lot larger, but it hasn't had a lot of airtime in, in South Africa yet for a number of reasons, and we're generally just behind behind the U.S., but it is the fastest growing area of venture in in the U.S. and Europe, and it, it garners quite a lot of capital from you know various role players within the real estate industry and, and other industries. And I suppose, therefore, kind of it's, it's, it's a lot more developed. So, I mean, to your, to your kind of pointed question about the challenges we see in, in these early stage startups. And I think it's it's anywhere where, particularly where the tech guys don't come out of real estate, they don't understand it. The tech guys sometimes seem to know best. And they say, this is the chat, like I know your problems better than you know your problems. And this is what I want to solve for. And tech guys often like doing things that are sexy, but don't necessarily uh, have a lot of value. And the real estate guys on on the other side are saying, this is what I'm doing. I just want to automate it or do it slightly better. And, and the answer is somewhere in the middle where we don't always have to do things the way they were done. There are better ways of doing things that can be more efficient, which is a complete step change. And we are looking for step changes. But the tech guys need to really understand that value proposition and what they're trying to deliver and understand the pain point of the, of the commercial real estate guys. And it comes down to product market fit, but it's really having a very clear understanding of that. Otherwise, it's just nice to have sexy tech, but it doesn't prove to have a lot of operational value for the, for the real estate guys. And if that's the case, you're just not going to get adoption and ultimately not going to get funded and, 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 and. Um, I'm not saying that's the story with, with How's Me, because I don't think that was the, the case. And I'm sure Ben will get on to kind of the, the reasons why and why not it kind of came about. But but making sure that a clear value proposition is is the right uh, is the right way to go, and it's not just take for tech's sake, but but it really delivers value to the real estate guys. I'll say is uh, is is one of the first big challenges um, that these guys should, that that any emerging kind of prop tech guy should focus on. And and to build on that, if, if I may, uh, you know, we wish we had had a Peter, a Matt on board, uh, you know, in part of our journey. One of the reflections was uh, how easy it is to marry the solution as opposed to the problem. And so what you really want to have is this, is this uh, understanding, as, um, uh, almost this obsession with solving the problem. And you don't mind how, what the solution is. You as a, as a tech company will build anything just as long as it solves it better than anything else. And uh, without that guidance, without the industry knowledge and the, the expert in, insights that come from guys who've been doing it for, for decades, 
you often do miss the the nub of the problem and, and your solution therefore is 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 off the mark and that's why we've so actually Peter, seen a lot of so so Peter, what i want to just add yep. to that because it's it's mm. important what ben has just said because your your involvement is not only just from a funding point of view it seems to be from a mentorship sort of driving yeah. perspective yeah. where you want to yeah. you you actually invested in the success of the company as well is it am i right well, hundred percent. I mean, we we make no kind of we we invested in the financial success of the business and growing and scaling it and making money. But to do that, you got to understand the you got to understand the problem and where where it's getting built out to. So there, there's a lot of capital available in this world for good ideas. But the problem and and I think Ben is touching on exactly that. If the capital doesn't understand the journey and the problem that it's trying to solve, it can misguide the company into solutions that aren't necessarily fit fit for purpose. And I think that's why it was very important for us to have be focused on this niche of prop tech. Both myself and Matt, our background is real estate and we sit very closely with the real estate guys. So we, we really want to understand the pain points and not only providing capital to the likes of these startups, it's really sitting and making sure there's the right product market fit. So we spend a lot of time with our corporate LPs, understanding their pain points within their businesses, what they need solved and translating that and making sure the companies grow and scale in the, in, in the right direction. And, and I think that's been why other capital hasn't really got involved in this prop tech uh, investment scene in any significant way, because they haven't been able to solve product market fit and distribution on an industry wide basis, which is really kind of the genesis and the setup of, of how we've structured the, the fund that we we've, we've been able to put together. Um, so it's right. It's capital, but more than capital, it's distribution and it's product market fit. Those you you, you need all of that to get it right. And, and that and that mentorship, uh, Neil, that that Peter's providing, Matt's providing, is so important uh, that that is genuinely that that is the pivot that I've now made on the other side of the table. Now assisting startups, helping founders, doing advisory work, uh, participating in investment rounds in order to carry across that uh, level of input and insight, and also. The empathy to to the founders who, who are in the trenches day by day uh, to get to get them uh, to see things like investors would like them to be seen or or like the, the problem needs to be solved. So it really is a it's not just a fund manager speaking there. I think it's a problem that, of course, uh, you know, um, three dimension have, have identified, but it's pervasive across the industry and across many funds as well. Great. So Ben, I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask you now to elaborate on the sort of the Hasmi story now. <laughs> You know, many people would look at Hasmi and they say it was a failure. You know, it, it wasn't a success, but but there were successes. And, you know, and I think any business has a combination of both success and failures all the time. And I think it also happens on a daily basis. But yet we only look at sort of the end result. So, Ben, can you maybe talk about the successes and then more importantly, recommendations for entrepreneurs, what you learned at Hasmi? Sure. So, overarching recommendation: go buy the book, uh, and and then you'll you'll get a much more detailed um, a detailed analysis of what we think and and what we've been able to reflect on. I think uh, to address your first comment, I think it's it's a good one, and it's not the first time I've heard it. I think it's a worthwhile question. You know, uh, was how's me proof that it can't work? Um, I think that that is uh, it's a fair question, even if a little bit uh, misdirected. I think how's me went after two very unique. Um, challenges that most other startups that I've done, most other prop tech companies that are probably getting funded um, will not do. And, and the one is we were B2C first. Uh, and the second is we were value chain integrators. So we didn't focus on one niche and we didn't focus on what I consider slightly easier market, which is, uh, as, as Peter pointed out, sort of these big companies looking to solve their own problems. We were going after the mom and pops with one or two properties in their portfolio. Now that makes our story unique and it must be put in the context of being very highly challenging in more than one dimension so startups are really tough raising capital is really tough building teams are really tough, and now you're adding on the two more difficult sort of uh, directional sectors that, that we targeted with that said what were the successes well we moved from being unknown to being sort of if not uh, known then certainly uh, known about uh, in, in the sector in a, in a course of four years we built out four different financial services products or financial products that went services uh, specifically uh, that enabled tenants to to rent without paying a deposit they enabled a rental guarantee for landlords we still by the way get asked about that whether anyone can buy it from us uh, still um, 
And then uh, most importantly to me, and where I would say our major success was we, we solved for the impact that we wanted to make, which was to reduce uh, the racial discrimination in South Africa. So House Me at its genesis, at its core, the, the product we built was an auction that allowed tenants to bid on what they were willing to pay and landlords would have to, so long as they met the credit criteria, would have to then take the highest bid. And that removed uh, discriminatory or, or unfair discriminatory factors from that process. And we had wonderful stories, we've detailed a few in the book, uh, of, of landlords who, who had a particular bias or perception of a tenant. We pushed that tenant through and within the year, they were so happy that they'd signed a second lease, a third lease, and in one particular case, uh, actually um, it had a, a, a more deep relationship with, with that tenant going forward. So, so that was really the, the sort of social construct that Housme was, was built to solve. And I think we did that. What the other success stories were, and I'll touch on them, we did manage to scale and that was unique for a B2C company. And the way we did it was to partner with marketplaces. So we ourselves did not want to become a marketplace. So we saw that as a key cog in, in the engine, uh, but Property24, Private Property Country at the time, Facebook market, these are all conduits to find uh, tenants for your property. We didn't want to compete. And so we actually forged agreements with them and use them to distribute. And then not only to distribute, but we incentivize them to provide leads and then not just for tenant leads, but for landlord leads. And to give you an idea of the scale that we could achieve in that way, uh, within the first month of one of those partnerships going online, um, we, we our average uh, sort of landlord growth was about um, 30 properties a week. Uh, and this was uh, 300 uh, over the course of five days that we actually had to switch the program off uh, because it was so effective. So that we tested things in a way that hadn't been done before. Uh, and and I suppose the, the other thing that I will say is as a success, um, not financially perhaps, but the team that built this was so uh, so committed to the vision and the impact we could have that both landlords and tenants and in some cases companies have still gone after the team that we've worked with, either hired them, asked them to join, um, still have relationships with them, have loved the experience. And if that was the only sort of impact we could have, then uh, in that way it, it was a success. I would even add to that, Ben, that you actually were successful in disrupting the rental industry because at 2.5% management fee compared to a 10% plus, at that particular time, you definitely had people's attention. Your, your, your comments around that. Uh, I agree. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's a double-edged sword. So what would we have done differently? Uh, every Every business that fails will say, well, if I had more money, I wouldn't have. I think it's a, however true it may be, it's not a helpful answer to pass on and tell the next person, well, just raise more money and you'll be fine. I think that we, we could have adjusted our pricing early and we could have gone higher. Why on a, um, why on a thesis level that didn't resonate with us is because our goal was to have low margin, high volume. And that takes time. So coming back to the model we were building, it wasn't then just B2C, it wasn't then just um, in, integrated platform. Thirdly, we were going uh, high, mar uh, high volume, low margin, which most uh, advisors would, would say is, is a that's a tough combination to get right. So, you know, in honesty, and uh, Neil, we were uh, about a, a halfway uh, in terms of the scale we needed for that to become profitable. And uh, you can look at it then as either successful or unsuccessful. To me, we haven't, it's one of the questions we ask in the book, I don't know if the model is successful. I think given more time and without COVID, it would have actually ramped up. But it's hard to make that uh, judgment uh, without saying, well, you could also change price. Or I don't yeah. know, Peter's got a view, I know. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll say, like B2C is incredibly hard, right? B2B, you can you can scale a lot quicker and easier, but, but B2C, when you get it right, the payoff is that much bigger and you get really kind of established and you're not beholden to, to a few clients. So I think it's a holy grail if you get it right, but you go look at the stats and it's just, it's a lot harder to, to get there. So, so it was certainly a hard battle the guys were going after and a very kind of incumbent industry where there's a lot of people who are incentivized to not make it work. Um, you think how many estate agents and brokers are out there who, who could get disrupted by this. And the kind of holy grail of an of an end to end residential system with a whole lot of financial incentives or financial product overlay, I think is hugely attractive to to a lot of people. So there certainly was disruption, um, and I think it's going to come, and the market is going to move that way. My my view on the pricing, 
is that if you price like a broker, you smell like a broker, and people just think of you as a broker, well, you actually got to disrupt and move it to a way where the pricing does not reflect that of a broker and is more of a static pricing, which, which you know, it might kind of back solve to 2.5%, it might back solve to 5%, who knows? But you kind of fix the pricing at a certain at a certain level. Um, you know, there's a company, Open Rent, who do it quite successfully in the in the UK and various other markets. Um, but you you don't want to you don't want to look and smell like a broker to to do what Ben is doing. You want to look and smell like a a tech platform which allows the end user to be able to manage uh, the full life cycle of their kind of buy to let uh, apartment. So Peter, so maybe, you know, you haven't heard what Ben said, you know, I mean, you see a lot of movies, you see a lot of presentations, you see a lot of pictures, you've, you've seen a lot of historical wins and losses. You know, what, what are the startup challenges and triumphs and that you see as a funder of prop tech businesses and, you know, the funding rounds? And, and, but most importantly, on an operational, what are the operational and financial challenges uh, are you seeing and 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 the lessons, the lessons that yeah. that you have learned, uh, in general? Yeah. So I mean, I would have loved to have. You know, we weren't around when Ben was looking for his funding, and as you say, we we, we love to back good good founders. Um, there's, you know, being well financed is important in these in these games. It's a double edged sword taking money from VC because they also kind of want their pound of flesh. So it's not necessarily the right capital for for all people. I think the way we positioned is 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 although the structure is not dissimilar to to venture capital, it's a lot more kind of collaborative in in its nature um, and working together with these companies as opposed to kind of the US VC model of just you know throwing throwing the dart and and, and hoping for for the best. Um, so yeah, I think like in all these startups, you just you you got to have spoken about route to market, right product market fit, and then how the capital is going to get there, and, and kind of making sure they're solving solving the right the right challenges. And I think what Ben clearly demonstrated with with Housme was that they had a route to market. They were they were getting clients. Um, there was clearly a product market fit because clients were using it. So there were other challenges in being able to just continue to to scale the business from 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 there and there's always these kind of tweaks around around the edges and and sometimes the things live or die on these small tweaks um but there was clearly a product market fit for for what they were for what they were busy uh, or what they were putting out into the market i think what's also uh, important to note is uh, when we compare and you, you mentioned vc you know the perception of vc comes from the silicon valley almost mm. paradigm which uh, is exactly our understanding or was our understanding of the investors we wanted but the reality is that Africa doesn't operate in the way that Silicon Valley does, that Hong Kong does, Singapore, London, uh, New York. And so understanding that we had more time and perhaps going slower with maybe more patient capital, but also with having different growth metrics set out by investors who didn't understand that would have been helpful. And I think, uh, you know, you're talking about lessons, things that um, uh, property practitioners or entrepreneurs could could pull here is that it will just by net, by the virtue of it being here in Africa, any tech adoption, any new service disruptive uh, innovation is just going to take that much longer. Uh, you need a, 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 a J curve that's extended. And, uh, and you're seeing that now even in the private markets, these funds are becoming longer term or they're becoming crossover or permanent capital vehicles in order to accommodate not a three, four, five year return, but a 12, 13, 14 year. And, um, you know, in our case, to, to Peter's point, I think that would have helped us as well. Okay, great. I just want to reach out to our audience. If you've got any questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box. We'll have this, you know, Q&A session right at the end. So please don't be shy. No such thing as a bad question. And uh, so, Peter, maybe let's just go over to you yep. in terms of what you see as an ideal product market fit and, and innovation. And, you know, what areas need disruption and, and what doesn't need disruption? I think that's important. And uh, I'd also like to get Ben's comments on that as well. But, uh, you know, what are the innovation solutions uh, that, that are needed and, and, and the role of tech? Maybe if you can start uh, talking about that. Yeah, and I think prop tech, this is where it's different to, to kind of financial services and everything else because it's attached to a physical asset. We're not kind of 
all going to live in the metaverse and just operate in the cloud. We're still going to shop, live, work, get educated, get entertained in physical real estate. So there's, there's a tangible element to it. So it's how can you have tech as an interface between that and to manage, uh, and to manage the assets? So, uh, I mean, I'd love to hear Ben on, on product market fit, but for us, that's very important to be able to validate any investment case to really make sure and understand that what the tech solution is that the company is proposing has got relevance in, in the market and is useful in, in, in some form or fashion. And it always kind of takes some swings and roundabouts and, and it evolves, but that you are sol solving a solution that, that kind of is identified by the market and has, uh, has, uh, has, has value. Um, and finding that is the is the holy grail. So so that's it. And then it and then it's really about your route to market. And I think the B to C, the route to market there is perhaps the hardest. And particularly in a space like Ben was operating in, because how do you you know if your route to market is through the brokers, but you're telling them that you're going to disintermediate them, then that's not going to work. Um, so it's how do you really grow and scale a business like like that? And if you go look at any B2C businesses, particularly in the US, they'll just throw huge amounts of money at it, um, which doesn't, doesn't work in this environment. And that's how they, that's how they generate scale. Um, so route to market, very important on a B2C, not as important, but still important on a, on a kind of B2B type business. Um, uh, but the holy grail is you've got to make sure you're solving a solution which is, which is um, you know, can actually generate value. Because there's a lot of things tech can do, but if you know if it's only marginal and there's no money or no value in in the user creating it, it goes back to the beginning point it's just tech for tech's sake and it's nice to have so so needs to to see right things but interested to hear from Ben what the actual um problems are that need disrupting within that within that residential space and and how he he went about finding his product market fit yeah i think uh, i agree with the, with hearing a piece of, sorry neil do you want to jump in no, 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 I just wanted to, because I think what I want to bring in here, which is quite important from your perspective, Ben, is that uh, you also got a path as an investor and investor into early stage platform companies. You're also involved in that too. So your role is also, you know, from running a, mm. uh, and being a founder of a, of a prop tech company, you're also an investor now into that. And you've, you know, you've learned the lessons and all that kind of stuff. But yes, I would really like to hear in terms of what are those areas that, uh, that still need disruption and uh, which are the ones that are working well? Yeah. So um, I, I want to echo uh, sort of everything Peter said. I think the, the one point that I would add to to that and, and then I'll, I'll give my view on what shouldn't be disrupted. I think the things that should be disrupted are where you can capture value from the person you're, you're solving the problem. Now, what I to make that more specific, uh, and I'll use a rental chain as an example. It's the example we obviously dealt with. You've got a landlord you've got a tenant, and you've got a payer. Sometimes the landlord isn't actually the owner. So there's an intermediary there or a family member. Sometimes there's an agent relationship on either side, um, uh, tenant or, 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 um, or landlord. And then you don't know whose problem is going to be worth them paying if it's 2%, 10%, whatever it is. The thesis that all agents go by is we know enough about the market. We know enough about the value of your time that me doing this service is worth 10% to you. Uh, that is a that's their thesis. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. So our way of evaluating the product market fit was to say, okay, what are the pain points that a landlord feels in this process? What are the pain points a tenant feels, an agent feels, a property manager feels, a photographer feels? How do we go and solve those pain points? And unfortunately, uh, we didn't come up with one. It was a myriad uh, of problems. In, in fact, everyone we spoke to had a different problem. And so one of the things we made the mistake of doing is treating all problems equal. And so my little insight here, and you asked, what do we do as an investor? We are very clear, and I, I work uh, with Exeo. Uh, Exeo is a private equity fund manager, so we do late stage investments. We also work with Anza Capital, which is a venture capital firm. And so we're really right across the whole, the whole spectrum. And what we do very carefully is identify what is the primary driver of value to the paying customer, and what proportion of that can you capture? And in Halsme's case, we only towards sort of, I would say, the third year, which is probably not too bad, but it took too long, only towards the third year really identified what it was that people wanted. They wanted efficiency. They wanted someone to talk to, which we didn't realize. And they wanted uh, risk security. So for the tenant, that was the deposit. And for the landlord, that was the rental guarantee. 
And I think with with that understanding, um, we would have we would have let go of a lot of the other problems that we were solving well, but weren't driving value. So we had, uh, for example, a House Me Helper network. We had helpers uh, right across uh, cities doing photography, key handovers, inspections, viewings, anything that we needed an, a person to do that the tech couldn't do. Uh, and Peter made the point on interfacing. Um, you know, that, that's a problem to be solved. That there's definitely a company that can be built there. Our division was profitable, but it wasn't the core value. Uh, and so we, we, were, we, we weren't focused enough. And going back to sort of the, the lessons of, of the book, that's why we started. Lesson one is, is focus before you build product, before you raise funds. What is it that you're going to focus on? I think what we shouldn't focus on, or where, where I think property works well, I think having a person is simply not going to change. I, I've seen and read and contributed to research showing others uh, other ways, but you will always want to talk to someone. And the reason, my, my thesis on that is... Um, because property is such a large proportion of your life, whether it's an asset, uh, often you know the, the most valuable asset, or it's because you spend most of your time. In either case, it's too important to let someone else dictate or decide for you. Uh, and the second reason I think, so, so I, would, I, would, I would effectively, I would keep people as part of the process. I wouldn't disrupt that. I would uh, supplement or augment or enhance that. And then the second thing that doesn't need disruption is, in my view, uh, marketplaces. I think that they are exceptionally uh, well positioned and difficult to disrupt where I think there is room for disrupt. What I would be focusing on today is pulling as much data as I could from ratings, from behavior, from listings, from sales prices, from rental prices, and providing advice back to landlords, agents, tenants, whoever it is on how to best engage with this property, this community, this suburb, uh, this problem. Uh, that's probably where I would, I would aim uh, if I was to start over. I think you you muted me. <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Just uh, once again, uh, uh, your version um, in terms of what you seeing in terms of what does and what does not. Just to, just expand a little bit on uh, on on what Ben has said in the areas because you've invested in quite a few companies and obviously you you have very specific reasons for following that. So maybe just just uh, just elaborate and, and 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 you understand the prop tech space pretty well. I yeah. mean, you you. So maybe just so, elaborate on that. So I mean, prop tech is a very diverse and broad broad theme. I think it covers everything from user experience to kind of big data automation, SaaS packages, smart buildings, smart cities, BMS stuff. So there's quite a wide and range and kind of remit of what you of what you can include and. And certainly an overlap with fintech, which there was in in the case of of Ben's business, um, and and a range of of other tech. So I think it's hard to kind of pin it down just what is a prop tech because it's it, it, it's pretty big. Um, I, I think maybe some of the other the kind of points to to add to that, which are slightly differentiated, is is that change management in any organization is massive. So get whether it be the end consumer or whether it be someone in a in a big large enterprise to get them to do something differently is what the biggest kind of hurdle to adoption is. And there's a lot of good solutions, but how they get adopted is is, is challenging. So um, where I think there needs to be a lot of work on a kind of a, on, the, on, the, on the large enterprise side is just really upskilling and changing people to, to be ready to change and do things differently. And people inherently don't like to do things differently. So, you know, yes, people still want to, on an individual side, still want to talk to people I, I mean, I was looking at stats the other day, the whole kind of outsourced call center service guys can reckon it's going to half in the next couple of years because of AI and other things like that, that they can solve some of those challenges a, a little bit easier. So um, so I think it's, yeah, change management is, is a big thing. And it's always just finding the early adopters who are going to pick up that tech early and then be able to sell it to, to the other guys and be able to use the, the, the test case. The other thing I'll say is, is team for, for these companies, kind of going back to some of our earlier points, is, is very important to get anything right. So what, what we are as investors in early stage tech businesses is we're backing ideas and with the right kind of product market, third route to market, all those things I've discussed. But very importantly, it's, it's backing a jockey and the right team you're able to execute and deliver on that. And you're really buying into someone's vision and getting behind that founding team to be able to go out and, and execute. So almost can't you know, emphasize enough 
how big a part of the equation that is, is really finding the right entrepreneurs. They're not, it's not for everyone. Some people are more entrepreneurial. Some people are less. Some people are you know, good at ideas, but bad at executing. Finding that right skill within a team you're able to execute and take something to scale is, is incredibly important. Okay, excellent. So, Ben, let's let's just unpack a little bit sort of technology's role in traditional sort of agency models. Because, um, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, Peter opened up the whole story about AI because <laughs> we haven't even touched on AI because <laughs> I think that's almost like a whole separate discussion that we could lead us in a completely different direction over here. But because uh, AI is definitely, I mean, I believe the industry where we talk technology per se, not prop tech, but technology moved from metaverse to AI. I mean, there's no two ways about it, to virtual 3D spaces into AI, artificial intelligence. So maybe just tell us about how you see specifically technology's role in traditional agency models, because that was kind of the area that you were sort of mm. uh, sort of focus and even though it was from a b2c perspective uh business to consumer by the way there was a question around that b2b business to business so maybe just just elaborate uh, just on on that there ben sure so so i think uh technology uh, sometimes has a, a very uh, unfair connotation of being difficult and disruptive and uh, uh sort of it's only for people who who, who are young and upcoming and, and want to cause chaos uh, and it, it's really not. Um, uh, technology is email, and it's uh, it's the you know it's it's letters after the um, signal fires that uh, were were done uh, hundreds of years ago. So in every in every case, we've got to identify well what is what is improving the experience or the output or reducing costs. So you're looking either at expanding margin or improving efficiency. That's how a businessman would look at it. That's I'm sure how Peter identifies his investments as well. Either we're improving income or we're decreasing cost. That is why we would do something. And um, and when it's put put like that, a hell of a lot of technology does neither. It looks great and you cannot translate it into one of those two or you cannot easily see a route to market for one of those two. And so I would say that that's where uh, technology and agencies has really struggled to compete with companies that are doing that. Uh, a great example of tech, even though it's old, is Payprop. Payprop is the incumbent and it is working incredibly well. It would be very foolish of anyone, even if you wanted to compete, to say it's a poor company. It doesn't do its job. It does. It just does it so well that it's hard to compete. And so any form of tech that is able to, as I say, improve income or, or, or uh, improve efficiencies is, is really a, a winner. And that's not just B2B. In other words, not just business decisions, but even a consumer looks at it like that. Now, in the consumer games and in the B2C space, you have one extra dimension which is a little bit more fluffy, and that's brandability or feel-good factor. And interestingly, uh, that can often be a bad signal for startups. We had a, that happen where we had early adopters come and use our system and give us feedback which actually was not right. It was good feedback for them, they were honest, but they were so biased towards wanting to try this, this being the solution for them, they can't wait to have a non-racial pro, that they would just tell us the system worked well, there were no issues, there were no bugs, and so we started building things in the wrong direction. So that's where, uh, again, B2C can, can be a little bit um, of, a, of a challenge. Mm -hmm. I think that in terms of where technology should be used, uh, if I can then spin, spin the corollary uh, around, technology really should be used wherever you're able to uh, repeatedly perform an action with high levels of accuracy. If, if that is your sandbox constraint, I would argue 10 times out of 10, there's a tech product that can solve it. And I mean, maybe just to add to that, like the, the agencies, there's a lot of tech already getting used. So, so let's, we're not going from analog to digital completely. We are just looking for step changes to do things better and in different ways. So the agencies are already, as, as kind of Ben mentioned, they're using pay prop, they're using different kind of software or kind of aggregated platforms to get lead generation. They're looking... They're looking at, well, they have various different CRM packages to help them manage kind of all the inbound leads, how they take it. So there is a lot of tech already in some of these businesses, but it's still very high touch with a big human overlay. And they're not kind of in these fully integrated end-to-end -end systems and processes as yet. But there's guys working on it and there is tech integrated in, into these businesses. And maybe onto the, the AI side, which was, which was your question is, 
I think it's a big word and everyone's thinking about it. And yes, it's going to disrupt, but it takes a long time to get there. And it's not just overnight, you know, it's, it's quite a buzzword, but people don't really understand the kind of nub and the genesis of all of that. And, and as a starting point, you need data for AI to be able to go and work off. And if you're operating off a paper lease, you know, it's, you first got to get a digitized format of that before there can be an AI overlay to provide any kind of insight or in anything else or help you do that kind of process in a digitized way more efficiently. So it's it's not it's not just this big AI which is going to come and, 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 and take over. In, in the property world, I think where it's going to come and where there are some opportunities is where there is a lot of silo data, so just creating better insights and analysis on all of that to help inform decision making. In the in the residential space, it's going to be maybe it's chatbots, so maybe you know you don't need as many people on on the other end of the the side, and you can uh, answer questions and queries a little bit quicker and easier. You can put together adverts a bit quicker and easier because you've got these large language models that can put together a nice brochure and pam pamphlets in a lot easier way. So it's on the margin. It's not going to come in, and there's no like AI solve for that's just going to you know take away take away everyone's job over overnight. Peter, is it you talking? It was a Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I agree with you hundred yeah. percent. And uh, but essentially, I think that's the one area where I think people are sort of kind of trying to work out. You know, it works on social media platforms and that kind of stuff. And uh, but certainly yes, I agree with I agree with that. I mean, we're struggling if we look at the the real estate industry per se to get people off Excel spreadsheets, you know. <laughs> so you know, so people are still you know stuck in certain ways, and until they can actually see a cost effective way that that can move them off that particular platform, you know, that's yeah. certainly from from that perspective. Uh, yeah, but I think that's that discussion, Peter, I think is for another day because we could really get into a very deep and dark sort of discussion about AI. And I think maybe we should put that on the agenda in future and happy to have you on a panel to to really, you know, unpack that a little bit more. Um, so, 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 Ben, I mean, look, first of all, I just want to tell everybody listening in there, you know, you've got to get this book. It's called First Kudu. Here it is. Okay, you actually look on the top screen of where Ben is sitting. There's actually a QR code building a tech startup in South in Africa. It's a great read, and I encourage everybody to get it. Uh, on Ben's screen, you'll see there's a QR code. It just goes to you know, just send your details there, or if you're walking around in exclusive books, you can just buy it there too. Uh, so I really encourage it, encourage you to to read and uh, engage because there's definitely lots of lessons here and i think in this webinar in particular we're just really just touching on uh, just some of the the things and we need to kind of just go to a little bit deeper um which ben does with his ex-co-partner lorne hallendorf so ben just maybe you can talk about sort of also investor perspectives and sector opportunities where you see uh in prop tech per se going forward because now you kind of sitting where Peter is in somewhere, which is, you know, you got this helicopter view as well and you've been in the game. So your thoughts around that? Yeah. So, so we're not a prop tech focused fund. So my, my uh, comments here now are going to be broader than, than, uh, than of course his, uh, what he's uh, specializing in. And, and uh, in that regard, I'm slightly more removed from the industry than I was uh, five years ago. Um, so Three, three things maybe just to, to point out. Firstly, uh, I want to um, comment on the, on the example you gave of AI. AI is actually an excellent bellwether for how technology is not always valuable. So everyone is building AI, just like everyone's building prop tech. But why are only one or two applications going to win in 10 years? Because only one or two capture value sufficiently to compel a change in behavior. So the first point is, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for technologies that compel a change in behavior. If it is not compelling enough to change someone, we're not interested. And, and actually, unfortunately, I think most investors are not hard enough on that point up front. And so they let a team get too far with a product or service. Uh, and eventually you can't unwind all the investment you put in, but it's not a good story because no one's actually willing to do it. To, to, you, know, you can only incentivize someone so much to, to buy something or, or to use something. 
So we're looking for that. Secondly, we, we're trying, as, as I mentioned, I think we've all brought up data as a key component. We want companies, uh, founders, teams that love data, want to utilize it, are not scared of it, will iterate with it. Uh, and um, in uh, Andreessen's words, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they hold strong opinions uh, loosely. They, they weakly hold, weakly held strong opinions. In other words, if data changes their opinion, they're willing to go a different tack, but and that's what they'll go after and they're passionate about it. So that's sort of the, the second thing. And then the third, and, and you mentioned platforms. So we look at platform investing as one of our areas. We've got themes in financial inclusion, in food and agri, in education, in uh, healthcare, and now more recently in, in consumer platforms. Uh, in a platform business, uh, you really have to understand the ecosystem. We make very few investments there because there are very few players sort of really going after the entirety of a, of a value chain. And for those investments, we typically need a time frame of more than 10 years, which means either we, we enter once they've already sort of been building for five, 10 years, or we enter with a view that we can uh, sell on or partner with another fund, another, another capital provider to assist that entrepreneur. Um, one uh, point to note here, and I think maybe worthwhile for some of the, the uh, viewers, if you're not in the position of capital allocate, a lot of what I said might not apply. What you should do though, and what I encourage everyone to do, whether they're running a business or not, is at least have that advisor or sector mentor or uh, experienced executive that you're able to interface with once a quarter, you know, twice a year, and get the insight into where the industry is going, what technology is being used, um, what the opportunities will be. Uh, for sure, businesses that are built in 10 years time Will be in sectors that we haven't even thought about and they'll be much more successful than what we think success is today uh, and there are many examples through history of that so uh, keep keeping alive to those opportunities and then staying principled with what you're willing to invest in and, and work on uh, i think is the is the key wonderful i think having you know mentors like yourself ben and peter in the house would be fantastic uh, pardon the pun for house house me you know so <laughs> but certainly i think that's uh that's important i think that's definitely a key point that has come out there so so peter i just want you to add on that onto that as well because you know lessons for aspiring entrepreneurs you know sitting where you are sitting and also there's a question from the audience which is related to finance which we'll deal with a little bit later which i want you to elaborate on and you as well ben because i think it's relevant for both of you but maybe just talk about, you know, you know, what are the lessons for aspiring entrepreneurs wanting to, you know, looking at you to finance them and in terms of leadership, the team dynamics of, and that kind of thing that you're looking and, and yeah, obviously the mentorship we brought out as a key, yeah. key aspect. Yeah, I, I think that mentorship is right. And, and I think it all just goes down to solving the right problem. And are you solving a problem that, uh, you know, that, that needs to be solved and that there's going to be value created off the back of. And, and I like the way Ben put it, you know, are you going to compel, be able to compel a behavioral change from, from what you, from what you're doing? And, you know, we've seen companies who said, uh, you know, oh, we want to build a matching platform in a certain sector to be able to advertise spare space. And they've got such a big view that this is going to be the next best thing. And maybe it's been a great thing in another market, they build it and they've got zero listings and zero people on their site or because, you know, and it's, it's, it's not a problem that, that maybe is worth solving in South Africa. Maybe it doesn't have the right scale or they just think that you build the tech and the people will come, but it doesn't happen that, that way. So having kind of distribution of your product is very important. Tech can be built. There's a lot of people who can build the tech. There's a lot of people who can help solve the, solve the problem. You need a w way to be able to distribute that tech and get people onto your platform and actually using it, and that's really how our value is created. So I think, I think uh, engaging with people in the industry to understand what solving for the problem and not not trying to build a solution um, because you've got a view on what the problem is is probably the the kind of best advice for anyone out there. And the only way they're going to do that is by engaging with with people uh, with people in 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 the industry. Um, Otherwise, you're going to, yeah, you're really going to struggle to, to solve the right problem. Okay, great. I want to get into this question because it's an important. And yeah. guys, if there's other questions, please, you know, uh, please submit because uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar. But certainly, um, I think it's a very important one and it pertains both to you, Peter, and, and Ben. Um, where's he here from properly? And in, in, uh, P R O P L Y. He says, I have a question for Peter around, and I'll, I'll also say for Ben as well, because Ben's got that experience. 
whether the banks are currently showing any interest in prop tech companies and prop tech solutions in South Africa? And if yes, where is that interest focused? Okay, so I'll take the, the answer is yes, there is a lot of interest. One of our investors is RMB, one of the big banks. So we're seeing increasingly focused um, kind of interest on, on this prop tech world. Um, I mean, if you wind back and take a bit more of a macro picture of the South African property landscape over the last five years, it's been a challenging space. It's been COVID, there's been huge vacancies in Santon, and, and, and. So I would say, you know, some of that is starting to work through, but the interest is really picking up from the last year, year or two. Pre that, the banks, the financiers, the investors, the big property companies, they were solving issues. Uh, it wasn't the nice to have they were solving, you know, kind of these existential issues for, for their sector. Um, where is the interest? Well, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of banks looking at stuff on how do they help uh, sell and lease properties. Um, if they've got a big book of properties that they've repossessed or working with a client, how do they or how are they able to distribute that to the market more effectively? How are they able to have line of sight of all the, the lease agreements in place? How they're able to use big data um, to their benefit um, in profiling credit, tenants, properties. Um, there's a lot of the banks, you know, the, the interest can go quite wide, but you, you, you think about like everything from, well, you know, being at the financial services side, which I think there's interest, but hasn't gained any significant scale in, in any way from, from the banks. But the banks are, are, are offering a whole lot of value-added services um, to, to people through the apps to try and get people engaged in their ecosystem. And they're looking for various ways and angles to use property and technology to be able to get people engaged in, in their ecosystem using their reward system. You think about how much money, I think the stat was there was one and a half billion rand spent in the VMA waterfront in December alone. That's a property asset physical consumers walking around a physical asset how do you engage the digital community to be able to create rewards incentives use all that data and capture uh, capture some value out of out of that ecosystem and the banks are very interested in that you see the likes of the e-bucks and all the rewards and things but there's there's additional ways they're looking at getting getting involved there right ben i know from reading the book you i think it was just pre-covid you were talking to a bank, as I understand. So maybe just your, your comments uh, around that and then just in terms of getting banks to invest in you, because I'm sure you had some experiences with them too. Yeah, look, I think Peter gave a great answer and, and probably more updated uh, to the view that I had. I think uh, the only overlay I can offer is that if you're looking to approach them, don't say I'm a prop tech company and leave it at that. <laughs> say I'm a prop tech company and, and this is the value add to the bank. This is the data I bring. This is the financial product. This is the client. This is the bond this is you know whatever that is uh, oftentimes or, or in my in our experience this is now a few years ago uh, the division investing into you isn't a prop tech division it's a division with another goal or kpi that it needs to meet and if you can meet mm -hmm. that kpi capital can be deployed so you actually need to position uh, as i say not, not just as a prop tech company but as a conduit or something of value to them and i guess the same applies uh, to the lesson we spoke about earlier um, if you're going to get them to change their behavior, what is so compelling to what their problem is, not your problem, their problem, that they're willing to do that um, and pitch like that? Absolutely. Well, I think the fact that R&B had confidence in you, uh, Peter, is says a lot. And uh, and I think, you know, we spoke about the mentorship aspect in at length. And, you know, we, you know, to have a bank is fine, but to have somebody like Ben or yourself on the team is probably more valuable. And I think that definitely that has come out of today's discussion. So Peter, maybe you can just give us your final wrap. I can't believe where the time's gone. We've actually hit almost the bewitching hour. <laughs> maybe give us your final wrap, your final thoughts around that, and then just uh, sort of on the way forward. And then I'll ask the same for, for Ben. I mean, very quickly, I mean, we're very encouraged by the kind of energy in the prop tech space in, in South Africa. It feels like, you know, a few years ago, and I think Ben was ahead of his time, there wasn't much interest and excitement. There's certainly a lot more now. The big enterprise clients are engaging tech a lot more meaningfully. Uh, we're seeing adoption barriers kind of starting to, to reduce. We're seeing a lot more focus in, in the space. We're seeing a lot of companies getting born out of that. Uh, we're seeing it as an agenda item. I mean, you go back to 
you know, uh, simple things, conferences where there might have been something on tech and it was on the last day and the final hour, it's now moving forward or throughout a day of conference, you know, in every single panel, someone is mentioning, mentioning how tech, because it's, you know, tech can be, uh, sometimes it's, it kind of infiltrates all the different operational or investment characteristics and you, you start hearing the mention of tech across all these different strands. So, so there sort of, certainly feels like there's a lot of interest and energy coming into the space, which we're very happy for and uh, very keen to see new new companies getting formed um, and solving solving real problems in the sector. So um, yeah, it's great to great if there's some aspiring prop tech entrepreneurs for them to for them to help solve solve problems that this industry is facing. Peter Clark, founder and uh, managing director of RE Dimension Capital. Thank you very much for your input today, Peter. It's been wonderful. Now we're getting to Ben Thank to your you. final wrap. And Ben, you are allowed to punch a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Please, that's everybody, that's... get that book. So don't be shy. Because just by the way, next to you, the screen behind you, that uh, QR code actually goes to sending your names to us. And so if you are interested in the book and you can't get it at the normal outlets, just refresh, please send it to us and we'll ensure you get it. I think it retails at 330 Rand or whatever. But Ben, your closing thoughts, please. Thanks. Thanks, you all. Um... I said earlier, you know, I wish we had had the opportunity to work with sector specialists uh, in the fund space when we were building. So um, grateful for not just the ecosystem development, but the benefit it's going to have in South Africa. I think we must also take that hat here. Africa has a lot of problems, but uh, solving them is really what we should all be excited about and, and supportive of uh, within the within the ecosystem to help each other. And so if there, you know, there's opportunity to, to mentor or help or advise and, and always open to that. The book itself is, as you say, uh, available. We've we've provided some of our thinking and our lessons there. I would love any feedback, whether it's on that or whether it's to tell me how terrible or otherwise how's me was in your experience. Um, I still get a few of those calls, um, but but just say it's gr great to be on uh, with you, Neil, and and uh, I wish all of the current crop of entrepreneurs the best and hopefully uh, better advice and connections than than maybe were available many years back. Awesome. Gentlemen, I think that was a fantastic discussion and I want to thank all of you and to the audience. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your valuable insights and your expertise. I think it's been truly insightful. I think it's been a great discussion and I think it's to be continued. Once again, I'm going to say everybody get that book. You know, the first Kuru building a prop tech company or a tech startup company in South Africa. And uh, so once again, to our audience, I'd like to appreciate your active participation. We appreciated that your engagement. And uh, so we hope you have gained some valuable knowledge. And I think it's important and that you are motivated to take action towards your own journey and whether it's building a tech company or building a property company. And uh, just before we close, I just want to remind you of our upcoming webinar next Thursday. It's 11th of April, same time, 12 o'clock titled, Unlocking the Path to First-Time Property Ownership. So we do a number of different sectors every week guys so it's always at the same time on a thursday 12 o'clock to register you just find the link uh, either in the chat box or uh, uh, sheik if you can maybe pop that in there and uh, also additionally we also have these two must-see events here in cape town and johannesburg in may robert kiyosaki live and a lot of people read the book rich dad poor dad uh, i'd read that alongside the first kudu because uh, uh, add that to your reading uh, repertoire uh, as I say, you can register using the QR code behind me. So once again, thank you once again to Ben and to, to Peter. Thank you very much uh, for your input today. It's been really an insightful discussion. And for you, the audience, we wish you all the best on your path to success and wealth creation, successful investing. And until next week for our webinar at 12 o'clock, this is Neil Peterson of Real Estate Investor, Ben Shaw and Peter Clark signing out. Cheers, guys. Yes, thanks. Yes, everybody. Great. Job.